Good morning, church. This is Zach Rudolph. And I'm Stacy, and we are so excited to have you joining us for Church Online today. It is a communion Sunday, yes. so go ahead and grab your bread, crackers, juice, whatever you would like. Donut. To donut to partake in communion. We're going to jump into worship. We'll see you back here in a minute. Good morning, real life, wherever you may be today. We invite you to worship with us as we lift up God count all his goodness, all his greatness. Let's sing together. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I It's a reminder that Christ is the solid rock on which we stand, and He will never, ever, ever fail us. 
The Word says God is not a man that He could lie. So whatever promises He makes to us, He will fulfill them. And His promises are many and good. So let's sing about how He is our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation The rock on which I stand When everything around me is shaken I've never
church, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the promises that we have because of his sacrifice, his death on the cross, and then even more importantly and foundationally, God, his resurrection, which is our great hope that even the, even the grave, Lord, has been conquered by the power of Jesus Christ. So there's nothing in our lives impossible for you. There's nothing in our lives surprising to you. And there's nothing in our lives that could ever separate us from your love. So God, we give to you now all those things that feel shaky, that feel wobbly, that feel like they're falling apart under our control. And we give them to you, Lord, and say, we know you are the author and finisher of our faith. You have a path that you've chosen for each and every one of us that we cannot walk without you. We need you, Lord, as our guide. We need you as our foundation. So we give you those things, Lord, and we trust and believe that you want us to come to you with those things to make them right to take the broken pieces, Lord, broken parts and make them whole. So I thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the work, the work that you're doing in all of your children, the, your body, Lord, the body of Christ. We submit to that work in Jesus' name. Thank you for your foundational love for us. And we ask that you would speak to us now through your word, Lord. We long for it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Hey guys, welcome back from worship. Thank you, Vanessa and the team. Always a beautiful time leading us in worship. Hope you guys had a great time dancing and worshiping in your living room or your car or wherever you may be. We love being able to join together for church. And we are so thankful for how generous a church you have been in this season. Maybe you are joining us online because somebody invited you to check us out online, or perhaps you have been inviting people in. Regardless, we've seen incredible life change in this season, and that is because of invitations and prayer support, but also the way that you financially support the ministries of this church community. And if you're wondering, what does it look like to give? What does it mean to give? You can go to reallife.la slash give, and on your phone or your computer, we're adding a little how-to uh, for you today, letting you know, go ahead and just get out that phone, go to that address, reallife.la slash give. And we would ask for you to perfectly consider what it looks like to start to partner with the church through your finances. It's a tricky time. Gas is expensive. Things are expensive in the world, but we really believe that when you remember that everything we have is because God gives it to us first and we give back just a small amount, there will be incredible changes in your life. And we'd love to hear those stories. So go ahead and send us an email if you have questions, info at reallife.la. But let us know if you are ready to start giving. You can go ahead and start doing that today. We are so thankful for you. Yeah. Now we're going to get into um, the time of the sermon right now. I hear Pastor's got some fun illustrations he has in mind. So, you know, you saw him last week. He looked great. Who knows what we're going to get this week, but it's going to be a good time. Be blessed, guys. Enjoy the sermon. Church. God bless you. It's Pastor Jim. Good to be with you again. We have been in a series for several weeks now on the book of Galatians, a series called First Things, because we're looking at Paul's very first and most important and foundational message. And we've been looking at what that meant to the Galatians 2,000 years ago and what that means to us today. And uh, I am thankful that we are a church that is chasing after Jesus and faithful to the gospel. Thankful for all the ways I've seen that in the last week. Uh, we had a great uh, night of worship on Friday night. We ran a 5K on Saturday morning. 
Uh, it's a church, we're, we're a church that likes to pray and likes to care for people in need. And that's what the church should be. That's what Paul was talking about 2,000 years ago. And uh, so we're going to dive back into our studies of Galatians again today and round it out today. Take a minute and pray with me. Jesus, I thank you that you loved us enough to walk the earth, to preach truth, and to call us to yourself in love. And I pray that the message of Galatians would sink deep into our hearts, that we'd know that we're loved despite ourselves, that there's nothing that we did to earn it, and that there's nothing that we need to do to pay it back. Jesus, help us to dwell in that love, to live in that love, to pass that love on to others, to do away with all sin and brokenness and all legalism and self-righteousness, and just to live in the grace and love that you showed us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's get into it today. Uh, Galatians, uh, this book that we've been in for a while now, you know the story. Paul goes to Galatia, starts a church, preaches a message of freedom. Preachers then come from Jerusalem, sponsored by James, the brother of Jesus, early uh, leader in the church. And they say, no, you need to follow the law. Don't give up on the law. And so Paul writes an angry letter back that says, no, 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 you're saved by grace. It's not by obedience to the law that you're saved. And he gets in fights with Peter, and he gets in fights with Barnabas, and he gets in fights with James. And, uh, and so it's a fierce letter. The whole letter can be summarized by a parable of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells a little parable that summarizes the whole message of Galatians. This is the story in Luke 18 at verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Remember the Pharisees are the self-righteous religious leaders that everybody looks up to and fears because they use God's law to put other people down. And the tax collectors are seen as traitors to their own people, taking money away from the Jewish people and giving it to the Romans. So two people, opposite ends of the spectrum, go to uh, the temple to pray. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven. But beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. That is the sum total of the letter to the Galatians. Make sure you are not a Pharisee. Because there are people who are very religious, who go to church and they tithe, and they fast, and they do all the right stuff, and they didn't recognize Jesus when he stood in front of them. And for 2,000 years, we've taken this message of freedom that Jesus preached and acted like the people that Jesus argued with. We've taken the gospel of freedom and turned it into a message of the Pharisees. And Paul in Galatians is it pains to say, don't go running back to the law. Don't be legalistic. Don't beat yourself up with guilt. Don't beat other people up with condemnation. That is not why Jesus died. Jesus died to set you free from guilt. Don't go take it back again. Let him have it. And that's the, the whole of the message to the Galatians. So now, uh, we have to ask a good question. And it's a question that's on Paul's mind. Paul, Paul has been avoiding the question, but it's on his mind. And the question is, well, what then about morality? If I'm absolutely free, if I'm absolutely forgiven, if I could not earn my way to God in the first place, what about good behavior? Am I not obligated to do anything? If God is going to sin, uh, is God, if God is going to forgive the sins that I commit tomorrow because of my belief that Jesus died on the cross. If God's going to forgive the sins that I commit tomorrow, why shouldn't I go ahead and commit them? Like, what, what's the point of good behavior? I remember going into a pastor's office one time, and he had a sign up on the wall that said, how much can I get away with and still get into heaven? Right? And he was being ironic because he knew how many people actually thought that way. How much can I get away with and still get into heaven? Or as a, a fellow stu a student at UC Berkeley years ago asked me, 
Can't I just on my deathbed convert to Christianity if that's what it takes to get into heaven? Can I just cheat God my whole life and, and assume God's not going to figure it out and at the last minute say I believe in God and then get in? Uh, that's uh, America's top, top talent uh, right there because uh, being smart doesn't make you good. Um, or as Augustine of Hippo, one of the early church fathers, once prayed, uh, he had a mistress and he knew God was calling him to a more righteous life. And he once prayed, God, make me chaste, but not yet. Right? Make me pure, make me innocent, but not yet. I'm kind of having fun. Right? Well, Paul says, what about that? What about people who think that way? And Paul often addresses the question. He says, should we then sin so that grace may abound? Is it, is it okay to just go ahead and sin? And he always answers the question, of course not. Of course not. But he's going to explain to us then what comes of morality, morality what, what we do with it. Uh, what, do we, what do we do with this life that we've been given in freedom? And we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5 at verse 13 now. And we're going to see how Paul answers the question. Paul is going to do the one thing he has been avoiding doing through this whole letter. He's going to give us some rules. Because the whole letter has been about the fact that we are not saved by following rules. And it really pains him to try to name any. But he wants us to know that we're still called to a moral life. And so in Galatians chapter 5, he's going to name it. Here he is, Galatians chapter 5 at verse 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh de desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the spirit. You're not under law. He's not trying to create new laws here. He's not going to create new laws. But what he's going to do. Is give us what was called a Greco-Roman vice list. A list of things that are bad behaviors. And a, a virtue list, a list of things that are good behaviors. And this list of good behaviors are called the fruit of the Spirit. And it's probably the most famous passage in Galatians. It's one of the most famous passages in Paul's writings where he tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. And he'll go through this list. But he wants us to see that we're not being given a, a list of rules to follow because the law only killed us. The law only enslaved us. The law only showed us that we weren't good enough. He's not trying to give us a, a bunch of new laws. He's trying to show us what happens when we follow Jesus. And, and what, what happens when we follow Jesus is like this. Christian morality and secular morality do not work the same way. Secular moral, morality says this. You need to try harder to be good. And if you don't, we'll punish you. We'll cancel you. We'll, we'll, we'll take you down. So you better try really hard to bring about good behaviors. And if there's all kinds of mess under the surface, we don't care. Behave well. Fit in with society. Secular morality says, force good behaviors out of you. Christian morality uh, compares good behavior to fruit that grow on a tree. Remember, fruit don't grow because the tree tries really hard. You don't, see the fruit, you don't see the tree out in the yard going, mm, hum, hum, and then fruit pop out, right? That's not, how, that's not how trees work. That's how constipation works. That's not, that's not, that's not what Paul's after here. What, what happens in Christian morality is not that we force good behaviors out of ourselves. It, it's the other way around. Good fruit grow when a tree is rooted in good soil. If you want to know where the fruit came from, you have to look at the root. And Christian morality says this, root yourself close to Jesus. Dwell in his presence. Dig down deep roots in his message and in his presence and in his love. And as you, as you dwell in the presence of Jesus, good fruit will just naturally form. It's actually the exact opposite of secular morality. Secular morality says, will yourself to good behavior. Christian morality says, dwell in the presence of Jesus. And the behaviors will grow from there. And Paul says it's, it's like this. You can either follow the flesh or you can follow the spirit. And those two in his mind are driving forces that do the work. Uh, it's like uh, hitching your wagon to a horse. Uh, 
and one horse is e headed east and one horse is headed west. And if you hitch your wagon to the horse that's headed east, you will go east. And if you hitch your wagon to the, the horse that's headed west, you will go west. And you will not do most of the work. The horse will. You get to decide to whom you attach yourself, but that force at work then does the work. And Paul sees the flesh and the spirit as living things that work the same way. You can either serve the flesh and let it guide you or serve the spirit and let it guide you. And Paul will say in Galatians 6, those who sow to please the flesh will reap destruction. And those who sow to please the spirit will reap eternal life. That's where those two forces are headed. Uh, it's kind of like this. Imagine this. Uh, imagine uh, you're uh, trying to figure out uh, how you want to how you want to spend your life here, and so you uh, you've got you got some choices to make in how you spend your life, and uh, you, you're really you're you're kind of you're kind of at at uh, you're kind of at a midpoint between different forces that are that are pulling on you, and so you find yourself being pulled in two directions towards destruction and towards eternal life, towards the fruit of the Spirit and towards just a mess. Uh, and I'm going to call up a couple volunteers to help me with this uh, to, uh, to, to illustrate how Paul is envisioning the flesh and the Spirit work. So Tudor and Zach are going to come up here. And you're going to sit on either side of the line. I'm in the middle. And, and I can choose which way I go. I can choose who I court. You have to realize, though, when you, when you make a decision, it's not a casual one. And the forces at work in your life are, are living and can act upon you once you make a decision. So let's say I decide that I want to indulge the sinful nature. That I want to just go out and enjoy myself in ways that are not good for me and that I know I shouldn't do. Tudor over here is going to represent sin for us. He's not typecast. He's a really good guy. He's not, he's not, I didn't put him over here to say anything. I'm just saying. But let's say, um, let's say I in my life think to myself, I think there's some stuff that uh, I can probably get away with. God's probably not paying that much attention. Uh, it's not going to hurt anybody. Nobody's going to notice. And I go over here and let's say I just kind of shake hands with, with sin, right? Now, what I don't realize is that sin has a mind of its own. And which I go to engage it, it starts to pull on me. And, and, and the more I let it pull on me, the stronger that force gets. And it leads me where it wants me to go, right? And, and if, I, if I spend enough time over that, that force will just get stronger and stronger, and its goal is to lead me to destruction. Now, if I indulge the Spirit, if I go and shake hands with the Spirit, if I, if I say, I want to live a life centered on Jesus, and Zach's not Jesus. He's a good guy as well, but he's not. I, uh, he's a good guy as well. But if I, go to, if I go to indulge the Spirit, the Spirit will do something similar but slightly different. Are you eating my fruit over there? <laughs> slightly different. Than what, uh, than what the flesh does, than what sin does. Because when you engage the Spirit, the Spirit does not force you to do anything. The Spirit will guide you if you want to be guided. And it's trying to guide you towards a fruitful life, towards a life that's filled with, if you eat all the love and joy and peace, there's not going to be left for everybody else. It, it, it will lead you towards, towards the fruit of the Spirit. It's not going to force you. If you pull your hand back, it will let you go, though it will pursue you. Right? And, and so Paul envisions us at this, at this center point between these forces waiting to take hold of us and move us in a certain direction. And, and as we live our casual lives, we may assume we can just indulge in either one and it won't affect us, but that's not right. If I go to indulge the sinful nature, if I go to indulge the sinful nature, it's going to start pulling on me. It's going to start tugging on me because its ultimate goal is to get me in a place where I am stuck, where I am so immersed don't let me fall down here. Where I'm so immersed in guilt and shame that I can't ever envision going back. It wants me stuck in the trash. Uh, and now I'm thinking I probably should have looked in here before I stepped in here. Because there's a fruit of something else in the bottom of this. <clears throat> uh, but this is, this is what the flesh is trying to do. This is what sin is trying to do. It's trying to get me stuck where I feel so guilty and ashamed of myself, I can no longer envision returning to a life of love and joy and peace. You got me? All right. So, uh, so let's, uh, let's thank our volunteers for helping us out in our video. Over, way over on the Glendora campus, let's thank our volunteers. So we, they can hear you from over there. Thank you, gentlemen. That's the $1.50. <laughs> uh, so, so this is how Paul envisions the flesh and the spirit. It's, it's pulling us in different directions. And, and the flesh wants us stuck in a place of, 
of sin and destruction. Sin wants us stuck where we no longer, no longer even feel inclined to pursue the fruit of the Spirit. So what of morality? If we are saved by grace, if we are absolutely free, we nonetheless root ourselves close to Jesus so that the fruit of the Spirit will grow in us. We no longer pursue the things of the flesh because the things of the flesh will leave us feeling like trash. I am preaching a sermon standing in a trash can to you. Remember the Apostle Paul writes to, I think it was the Corinthians, and he says, I've been shipwrecked for you. I've been in prison for you. I've been beaten for you. Yeah, but did you ever preach from a trash can, Paul? Okay. This is how much I love you. <clears throat> so this is, this is Paul's message. He, he wants us uh, to, to hitch ourselves to the things of the Spirit and not to the things of the flesh. Um, here's the good news. Uh, by, by dwelling in the presence of Jesus, you can rewire your brain. You can, you can reorient your life towards things that you thought were out of reach. And I know some of us have lived such a life of self-destruction that we think we've gone too far. That God cannot forgive us. We've wrecked our family and our relationships. We're struggling with addiction. And the life of the spirit seems so far away. But, but neuroscience has uh, discovered just in the last 50, 70 years or so, uh, some fascinating things about the way the brain works. The, the brain enjoys a feature called neuroplasticity. That means the brain can actually rewire itself, can reorient itself uh, when, it, when it needs to. Generally, you and I get settled into habits. We get settled into routines. If, I, if I'm used to living a trashy life, I kind of stay there. Uh, neuroscientists since the 1940s have used a, a famous little phrase. They say the, the neurons that fire together wire together. In other words, the way you get used to thinking about things is kind of the way you continue to think about things. And their famous metaphor is... Uh, if you imagine somebody going through a jungle with a machete and cutting a pathway, that's how the neurons fire. They, they, they come up with a, a regular pathway of thinking about things. And once you cut that pathway through the forest, you're probably going to take the same pathway again because it's easy to get through. And so our, our habits of the mind become routine. But because the brain can rewire itself, because of, because of neuroplasticity, Plasticity, because the brain can reorient itself, we actually have some, some spiritual exercise that can reorient our thinking even when we've long since committed ourselves to broken lives. If, if a brain, if part of the brain gets injured, uh, neuroscientists have discovered that other parts of the brain can take the place of the part that's injured and do functions that that part of the brain used to do. Different parts of the brains can re, part of the brain can reorient itself to take up tasks that used to be done by the injured part of the brain, and, and they begin to study how how one can rewire one's thinking even when one is set in one's ways. They say that by the age of twenty five, your uh, your prefrontal cortex, the part that's uh, supposed to be responsible for moral thinking, is is pretty much done cooking. By by twenty five, age of twenty five, you're pretty much set in your ways. But they're beginning to explore ways that we can rewire our thinking, that we can retrain our habits. And, and brain scientists and behavioral uh, psychologists will tell you that by, by focusing on a vision of the life you want and, and practicing new skills like learning a new language or, or learning a musical instrument, teaching your brain to do new things, and then putting in place daily habits that will manifest that vision of where you want to go. These kinds of things will reorient your brain to think in new ways. And this is one of the places where science and the spirit work in cooperation. The Bible actually says things exactly like this. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 1, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Focus every day on a vision of a holy life, a life lived well, a life lived in the spirit. And then every day, immerse yourself in the study of the scriptures and dwell on them. 
Every day begin the, the daily habit, the daily routine of focusing on the vision for what you want your life to be. Or again in Deuteronomy 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Spend daily time reflecting on the life of Jesus and dwelling in the scriptures. And then begin to manifest the, the small daily habits that will enact the vision of a life lived in the spirit. And no matter how broken we've gotten, no matter how much, we've, how much time we've spent in the clutches of the evil one, we can reorient and rewire ourselves for a life in the spirit. And now Paul will give us a, a list of, of vices. He's, he's at pains not to tell us what rules are because we're not saved by law, but he's going to name it so that we can see what a trashy life looks like and what a life in the spirit looks like. Verse 19, chapter, uh, Galatians 5, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you can't earn your way into heaven by avoiding these things. But if these things are manifesting in your life, your roots are in bad soil. You've taken hold of sin and it has pulled you towards destruction. Uh, these these Greco-Roman uh, vice lists are not in any particular order, but the first word does command the list. The first word is the most important. Other than that, there's no ordering to them, but the first one dominates the list. So it's interesting that Paul says, among the acts of the flesh, the first one he names is sexual immorality. And in the Greek, this is actually two different words, one that means adultery specifically, and one that means all kinds of uh, sexual uh, immorality, sex outside of marriage, any kind of any kind of fornication, any kind of sexual impurity. And Paul makes the vice list dominated by that idea. Why would he do that? Why not dominate the vice list with hatred or disrespect or pride? Any of those would have made sense. But he makes sexual immorality first. And that's because sexual immorality is a twisting of what will be the most important of the virtues. The most important of the virtues is love. And sexual immorality is a twisting of love. In, in Christian ethics, uh, se uh, sexual immorality is a, a, a manifestation in our biology of what we believe in our th theology. And, and so in, in Christian ethics, historically, sexual immorality, has, uh, excuse me, sexual, sexual intimacy has been reserved for marriage between one man and one woman for life. And, and that's because our, our biology is a metaphor for our theology. Our, bi our biology expresses our theology. We believe in a God that chose humanity, something other than himself, to live in unity. And so we, as men and women, seek otherness in which to live in unity. And our biology becomes a metaphor for our theology. And so sexual immorality dominates the vice list because it's a twisting of healthy love. Now Paul will go on and list the virtues uh, that, he, that he sees in the life of the Spirit. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Uh, those are worth memorizing, those nine virtues. Against such thing there is no law. Uh, that's a clunky little sentence that could be better translated, about such things there is no law. This isn't about the law. This isn't about following rules. Remember, we're not trying to be legalists. This is what manifests itself in your life when you live rooted in Jesus. When you, when you dwell in the presence of Jesus, this is the fruit that grows in your life. It's not a new set of rules. It's, Christian morality is not, a, not an act of trying to force these good things to come out of you. It's living in the presence of Jesus. And these are the fruit that grow. And about these things, there is no law. 
It's just what happens when you love him. This is, this is dominated by the virtue of love because our biology is a manifestation of our theology. And living a life of love with those around us, this is what dominates the law, Paul says. This is the first among the laws, love your neighbor as yourself. That manifests in our lives what we believe about God. That God is a God of love who loved us when we were in open rebellion against him and called to us when we were living trashy lives so that we might dwell in his presence and be called to a life in the spirit filled with good fruit. Um, I'll tell you uh, what this is like. Um, You ever run into somebody who you just love being around because they're so gracious They're just such a nice person. They're so encouraging. Uh, The guy who used to be the pastor of this church back in the 70s, C.S. Coles, he was that voice for me. He was a voice of encouragement for me. And and being around somebody like that, you just can't wait for the next time you get to see them because they make you feel so good. You know anybody like that? Well, let me ask you. Would you like to be someone like that? Would you like to be someone that other people are just eager to be around because you are so filled with the fruit of the Spirit? You can be. And this is how Paul would tell us to get there. It's not by trying really hard. I'm going to be loving today. I'm going to be patient today. I'm going to make it happen. It's by dwelling in the presence of Jesus. A few years ago, I met a guy who was a sommelier. Do you know what that is? Uh, if you do, you're, you're smarter than I am. I had to look it up. It's a wine expert. Uh, and a wine expert, uh, as a wine expert, he was just passionate about wine. And he could, he could tell by smelling a wine where it came from. And he could taste things in wine that were much more sophisticated than my palate. And, and, and he loved to talk about wine. So he, he told me the, the way wine works is it depends on the soil. The 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 grapes get their nutrients from the vines, and the vines get their nutrients from the soil. And so whatever is in the soil shapes the flavor of the grape and the wine that is made from it. If a wine has floral flavors or citrusy flavors or chocolatey flavors, it says everything about the soil from which it came. Now, I know this is kind of a bougie sermon illustration, but have you ever heard about Jesus' first miracle? He went to a wedding, and he turned water into wine. And he didn't just turn it into wine. He turned it into good wine. So if Jesus gets to do a bougie miracle, I get to do a bougie sermon illustration. Okay. He, he said, in heaven, we will drink the fruit of the vine together. You know what vine he's talking about? It's not bougainvillea. Right? So, so these vines grow into the soil and adopt the nutrients of the soil, and that shapes what goes through the vine and what ends up in the grapes and what shapes the flavor of the wine. Well, this is how Christian morality works. This is how Christian ethics works. We sink deep roots into Jesus. We spend time in his presence. We worship him. We live lives of daily prayer. We immerse ourselves in the scriptures and meditate on it when we get up in the morning and when we go to bed at night, when we walk along the road and when we talk with our children. We dig deep roots into the life and the presence of Jesus. And as we do that, he comes up through our veins, his blood in our veins, and he changes what we're made of so that people around us, when they're close to us will say, I like that aroma. This is a great bouquet. You know, I think I, I think I know where this one came from. I can tell that this person has spent a lot of time in the presence of Jesus. That's Paul's vision for the Galatians, and that's Jesus' vision for us. So let's pray that we would live fruitful lives dwelling in the presence of Jesus. Pray with me. Jesus, for those of us who have lived into trashy situations and we've been stuck and addicted to things that are bad for us, break the chains that hold us and set us free to life in the Spirit. Begin to rewire our minds so that as we 
reflect on you, as we reflect on your scriptures, we engage in a process of going sane. We reset our minds and our souls back to the, the, the factory setting, back to the way you made us to be, to people hitched to the spirit and being led to good life. Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross so that if anybody feels overwhelmed by guilt, if anybody feels like there is too big a gap between them and you, all we have to do is believe. I thank you that you set us free from the burden of the law and trying to earn our way to you. And so, Jesus, we proclaim together in our hearts, we believe. We believe that you died for us to set us free. Now, Jesus, give us those daily reminders of your presence with us and teach us to dwell in your presence, to live in your word, to spend time in worship and prayer. And as we do, may holy fruit emerge from us. God, make us a people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. About these things, we need no laws, because we have you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So at the end of his life, Jesus, Jesus left a meal to remind us of his sacrifice for us on the cross, so that we would know we're forgiven, we're set free to live a life in the Spirit. On that last night, he gathered with his friends around the table. And taking bread, he gave thanks and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so we eat this bread and we drink this cup. And we remember Jesus' death for us on the cross until he comes again. If you're at home today and you've prepared the elements, go ahead and partake in communion. And then we'll continue in worship together. Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that sermon. Hey, you got a little piece of me on stage. Sorry about that. Uh, the fruit was delicious. <laughs> Speaking of eating, thank you for joining us for communion today. Perhaps this is your very first time to participate in that. You have questions about it. Just know that everybody is welcome here. Everybody is welcome at God's table. You are loved. You're being cheered for. If you have questions, email us anytime. Info at reallife.la. Today's message was particularly um, meaningful for you or if you know someone who could have a little bit of hope, maybe they really like apples, go ahead and share this message with them on social media. If you have questions on how to do that, you can also reach out to us anytime. But have a super great week. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.